Good morning, good afternoon, and good day, wherever you may be joining us from. Welcome to another edition of the Digital Download. Which, which is, is the longest running weekly business talk show on LinkedIn Live, now officially syndicated on the RBGN Internet Radio Network. Oh, there was and, something else as well, wasn't there? Damn. Well done. Now globally syndicated on Tune in radio. <laughs> I'll, I'll we'll get, get you there. Really cool. <laughs> Today, we're talking about category creation. We have a special guest, Leah Parisian, to help us with the discussion. Longtime marketing professional and co host of Marketers with SaaS, Leah brings a wealth of experience in content strategy and brand development. But before we bring Leah on, let's go around and introduce everyone. While we're doing that, why don't you in the audience ping a friend? Have them join us. We strive to make the digital download an interactive experience. Audience participation is highly encouraged. Right. So with that, introductions. Adam, would you kick us off, please? Hello, everybody. I'm Adam Gray. I'm one of the co-founders of DLA Ignite. Uh, and I, I say this every week, don't I? I'm really looking forward to today's show. I am really looking forward to today's show. If Tim were here, he would say, uh, I'm famous for writing the book, Social Selling. For, and he has to say that because of what you're going to say a little bit later. <laughs> but I'm, ju I'm just pleased to be here. Ah. Excellent. Well, we're pleased to have you here, Adam. Thank you. Bertrand. Hi everyone, so my name is Bertrand Godillo. I am the uh, founder and managing partner of Odysseus & Co, a very proud DLA Ignite partner. And I'm glad to be here as well. And on top of that, I just learned that uh, I may not be the only French on that call. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Welcome. Tim. Hello. Um, yes, my name's Tim Hughes. I'm the founder and CEO of DLA Night. Um, really pleased to be here. And um, I'm the famous for writing the book, Social Selling Techniques to Influence Buyers and Changemakers. Great having you here, Tim. Thank you. And myself, I'm Rob Durant, founder of Flywheel Results. I too am a proud DLA Ignite partner, and I'm not famous for writing anything. Yes. Yes. Yet. All right. As I said, this week on the Digital Download, we'll speak with Leah Parisian from Poetry to Powerful Branding. Her journey reveals the intricacies of creating compelling narratives and innovative go-to-market strategies. Let's bring her on. Leah, good morning and Hello. welcome. Good morning. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Leah, let's start with this. How bad did I butcher your name? It was perfect. It was oh, very, right. very good. Excellent. It was very, very good. <laughs> good morning and welcome to you, Leah. Let's start by having you tell us a little bit more about you, your background, and what brings you here today. Sure. So originally I was a poetry major. I really thought I would teach poetry, uh, French symbolism, and uh, Dante, but that did not work out because I graduated at the peak of the recession and had to make some money. So that's how I got into documentary filmmaking, writing subtitles at the bottom of the films. And then I got into PR as a result of that and then worked in the manufacturing marine industries, writing very technical manuals, and then finally found my way into romance copy, eventually settling in on B2B, copywriting and content strategy. So, and a little bit of re retail sprinkled here and there working in a spice factory. So you could say a diverse background. <laughs> a lot of parallels between uh, romance writing and B2B writing, right? Yes, very, very <laughs> much so. <laughs> Excellent. So Leah, let's start with a foundational question. Sure. What do you mean by category creation? Yeah, great question. So. It's different than brand. Brand is how you present yourself to the world. I think it's your wrapping, your container, how you speak. Category is the problem you solve. 
So what is the big hairy problem that you're uniquely positioned to solve and through what mechanism? So it, I suggest starting with the problem and then figuring out how you'd like to present the problem to the world. And you were saying that's different from brand. Tell me a yes. bit more about that. How so? Yeah. So brand, I think of more of the aesthetic, how things are being communicated to the market, how when somebody's thumb scrolling, they see you, they recognize you, they instantly know who you are and what your value proposition is. Category is the problem you solve. So for example, Uber is a good example, right? They took a really difficult problem, hailing a cab and made it automated, streamlined and um, then became sort of this transportation and uh, even food delivery app now. So when you have a category to and own it, you can also find new streams for innovation. So that's how I differentiate. One is a problem. The other is more of a wrapping or an aesthetic and a tone. So it, is it difficult for businesses to identify what that category is? Because one of the things that strikes me is that so few organizations have really clearly nailed how they tell the story around what it is that they do. So lots of them have invested in a nice logo, nice copywriting and, and a brand manual that says, you know, we are we're, we're cheerful but serious or, or whatever it is that it says. But very few of them communicate uh, the what they solve, how they solve it and why I should care about that in a way that an idiot like me can understand it. So so how do businesses go about laying that out? That's that's a really good observation. And it's true. It's an area that's sort of skipped over, glossed over. People go to market and they wonder why this great looking brand or snazzy copy does not convert. And it's because they skip that really critical step. I think of it as um, I don't know if you've saw, you've seen the series The Expanse when there's that really morbid scene where he's sort of like taking the human body apart and studying how it's put together. I recommend the same approach. It's like a tinkerer. You need to figure out how the quantum bits, oh, sorry, connect to, with one another in order to grasp the whole picture. So that's my recommendation there is really get down to what is your product? What does it do? What does it connect with? The same can apply to a service. But if you don't understand the individual parts, you can't communicate your category and your unique differentiators. So uh, I guess following on from that, how, how do businesses start to tackle this problem? Because it it strikes me that, you know, you start a business because you're passionate about something. You know, there's loads of books like The E-Myth and that sort of thing where, you know, the woman bakes cakes and that's all she wants to do. So she starts her own cake shop and realizes that in fact, she's now got to do invoicing and finance and stock taking and all of this other stuff that is not core to what she wants. So <clears throat> I've started a business manufacturing plastic things. And uh, I know everything there is to know about plastics and manufacturing and everything there is to know about all of the technical side of things. And I hire in people, but they're either died in the wool marketers who know all about kind of the pretty logos and stuff, or the technical people who are just like me. So there's actually very few opportunities, I think, in, in, in business for the business to take a step back and think about this from the customer's perspective. You know, because I know everything about manufacturing, you don't know anything about manufacturing. So there's a we're speaking a different language, really. So, so how does a business go about unpicking that and starting to, to understand that category, that thing that they're trying to solve in a way that the customer can engage with it? Great that you ask. We're actually doing a listening tour as uh, Jim coined that, uh, Jim Tintaro coined that phrase. I don't know if anybody else did, but it's the first time that I've ever heard anybody, a CEO or anyone use it. And what we're doing is we're interviewing Customers, we're looking interviewing lookalike cu customers, so prospects in the verticals that are closely aligned to our ICP. We're also talking to technologists. We're talking to um, uh, people in the industry that have launched SaaS products before, and we're really um, trying to do expectation tests, which is one of my favorite type of testing, is show them a website, show them a one sheet, a sales sheet, 
and ask them, what is it that you think that we do without giving them any other context? The answer, the value you get in that question is unparalleled because you sort of see what are the patterns or is there a pattern? If there isn't, that's a problem too because you're inconsistent in how you present yourself. So that's one of the ways we do it is a listening tour, talking to your ICP, talking to industry heads, right, for your product or service. And then um, we segment them into friendlies versus like sort of cold uh, contacts and take that data and try to understand why are some of these misconceptions arising, if there are any. Hmm. I mean, it, it must be, it must be quite a difficult process to go through because inevitably the company is wedded to the stuff that it's produced that it thinks is a really good idea so yeah. tim, tim and i worked at a big SaaS company uh before we started dla ignite and uh it always makes me laugh that we used to do journey mapping you know it's customer journey mapping and it's never customer journey mapping it's always your sales mapping you know it's about when when do i need to show you this brochure or when do i need to offer you this workshop or in order to move you along to the next stage very rarely did did anybody ever take the time and trouble to ask the client or the prospect what they needed at, at this particular point and my my point is so how do you how do you take that on the chin you know i've spent ages working on our brochure and i showed it to to tim's partner and she said oh so you're an accountancy practice are you and i'm like ah, no 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 i'm joking but but you know what i mean it's like you have to be prepared to be very pragmatic and uh, and prepared to take some fairly fierce criticism potentially, don't you? Oh yes, and we we've gotten some. And um, but if you're not willing to take feedback in and grow, then you're in the wrong industry, and you you you're not um, qualified to lead, in my opinion. Um, you you need. I mean, there's also ways to deliver feedback in a way that's constructive, positive, and not you know just like this is the worst thing I've ever seen. So it is a two way street. But um, if you have a message in market and it's not converting, and the metrics tell you that it's not converting, then it's time to really do roll up your sleeves and do the dirty and difficult work. Um, and it's even at that point, it's hard to convince people. They're convinced it's a color or a word or you know, the landing page layout. And it's like, well, it's been four years of this iteration. It's clearly something deeper than a color or a word. Yeah, just a quick question on, uh, on this. Um, sure. Is there a good time to create a category? In, in, I mean, in today's uh, very changing environment, I suspect that uh, you may you may have to change or slightly twist your category uh, time after time um and, and maybe in some occasions i'm just thinking about you know going uh, you know basically crossing the chasm is probably also uh, a time where uh, you need to redesign all of that uh, what's your experience in in that uh, in that uh, content i mean on that specific topic. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's why the problem, if the problem's changing, right, it's probably time to reassess your category. If or if you, you know, are developing a bunch of uh, features, speaking to customers, and then you get to the source of a different problem than you than the one you originally started to solve, then it might be the right time to shift categories and it's really difficult now too because you have the emergence of ai the popularity there's a lot of uncertainty a lot of potential right and then the other mistake i've seen people make is they enter the market without sufficient market research and are creating a tool that is solving a problem that's already been fixed in a way that's not unique enough to be a differentiator like you've already lost footing by uh, not doing your homework properly. And that's a tough thing to do too. Um, and it's something that should happen simultaneously. But how about if you're, so I, I get that that's a, that that's a real possibility that you, you're developing something and by the time you take it to market, the problem doesn't exist anymore because things have changed or there's a, yeah. an incumbent solution. But how about if you've got something new? So, so not so much Uber, but, 
but say Facebook, for example. Right. You know, so, so nobody knows they need Facebook until Facebook launch and all of your friends are on it. And then you realize that you have to be on it as well. So how how do you, you deal with this idea that, that you're, you're breaking a path through complete virgin snow? You know, there, 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 are, there are no other people around you. You're doing something completely alien. And, you know, to, to quote Henry Ford, if I'd asked my customers what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. And, you know, so I, I think often we see that, though, don't we? And and potentially your your customer feedback isn't going to help steer you because they'll just go, well, what's the point? And the point is less about the, the fantastic thing I've created and more about you, the customer's inability to grasp what it is that I've created. How, how do we deal with that? That's a really good question. So I'm currently working on a social impact data and AI platform. And what it does is it switches from selling motions from pre-distribution to redistribution, meaning that like impact funding comes from a budget set at the beginning instead of it being a budget at the end. And it really changes how business contributes to social impact. And it's a hard concept for people to grasp because it's literally a new business model and then a new category of tool. Mm. So that is the big hairy problem I'm solving at the moment is like, how do you introduce a concept that has 140 searches really a month? And then how do you convey the value of that as a competitive differentiator, as a business driver, and then educate the market on how that enriched data flows into their existing tools uh, and for what use cases and benefits. So it is really um, breaking it down step by step. And the listening tours are helpful though, even if the customers aren't ready for it, you get a sense of why they're not ready for it. Um, and you get a sense of the objection. So then when you're doing that product development area, you're like, well, these are the objections. How can we smooth it over? Is it a fear of I don't know how to use this. Is it a fear of, I don't know where the budget is coming from? Is it a fear of, I don't know how my sales incentive is going to be calculated? So there's just as, a, as much value in the customer's inability to break through and see your vision as there is having a vision, I think. Hmm. I think I can see the answer to this, but I'd really like to get your take. You sure. mentioned 140 searches. And yeah. uh, uh, in terms of uh, category creation, that's really the challenge, isn't it? Nobody knows you exist. Isn't it just easier to pick an existing category and say, we do that too? Yes and no, because whoever has the foothold, the king or the queen in that category has the lion's share of the market, right? And um, do you want to be an imitator or do you want to break new ground and, you know, create a new category and own it, right? And then potentially there's more opportunity for revenue streams spin outs from that new category. Um, it's hard, I, you know, you sort of see it with like large conglomerates, legacy brands, and that's why you're seeing demergers in some of these bigger brands like Unilever with their ice cream business, is that they realize that they can't be everything to everyone. So really niching down and because there are so many solutions out there and there are um, very specific pain points, if your solution can integrate in an existing flow and doesn't create more bloat to tech stack, I believe, that's, I, I think it's micro solutioning the future. And that's kind of the way I'm seeing business and my field going. I don't know if you've observed that as well. You caught my attention at uh, revenue spinouts. Can you give some examples of what you mean by that? Let me see. I'm think of a good example. Um, so maybe this could be. This isn't the best example, but it's the first that comes to mind. But um, Kroger, for instance, has a really uh, big analytics and data arm that collects data from their vast footprint, and that's supermarkets. For uh, anyone who doesn't know that data could be monetized right if and turned into products so that you know you're having all of this consumer shopping behavior that can then be spun out into a different product right you have this first party loyalty data 
So, you know, whether you want to do a consulting arm, whether you want to build an app, whether you want to sell that data, it just opens much, many more possibilities. And they're sort of the people I think of when I think um, grocery tech um, and sort of that early analytics. Mm. What are some of the, the secrets to successful category creation in these already highly competitive markets? Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, I think you need to really look at what you're doing. Um, at one of the organizations I was at, they were trying to do too much, right? Um, are you diluting your category by attempting to serve too many verticals or offer too many products? So really looking at, um, you know, what is your niche? What is your area of focus and um, creating a category around that focus because it's hard to create a category when you're scattered also from a resources development personnel perspective um, if you don't have that focus it's really difficult to create a category but once your category is cemented then you can have opportunities to sort of branch out into these little like tributaries so I think most people start at this like delta with all of these tributaries instead of the opposite of starting with the singularity and sort of uh, branching out as they've cemented their category. Um, and in terms of how to do that effectively, uh, like again, like the person taking apart a toy car or radio, it's really looking at experience, it's looking at your offering, it's looking at your customer and figuring out, you know, where is the friction, where is the opportunity, and how is what we're building solving problems for the people we've identified as our target. And it, it's not like sexy work, it's time consuming, but it's worthwhile. And and when we when we know what our um, category is, what do we do with it? Oh, wow. It, it is tough. So, you know, there's a search front. If you're owning a new term, you want to populate that term and grow that term, but whether that's social impact business for us, social impact marketing for, uh, it would be leadership too, like going on podcasts, introducing the new business model, going on events like this and sort of spreading awareness about this new way of doing business. Um, uh, it's, a multi front multi channel approach, you know, Instagram, um, YouTube, uh, having awareness that this is a problem, right? The problem that we're solving isn't necessarily social impact. It's um, how do you build relationships? How do you cement relationships in an era where there's so much competition and noise? We're solving a relationship problem. The way we do that is through data AI. And the benefit of doing business this way is that it impacts the world. So again, we it took us a lot of rounds of interviews, listening tours, et cetera, to figure out, okay, we have all this cool stuff, but what if we had to boil it down, are we actually solving? And that is the hardest question to answer. And it takes a lot of focus, a lot of paper or digital paper being crumpled and deleted and redlined. And um, I think most businesses don't pursue this because it is challenging a lot of your assumptions and really like starting from scratch in many cases. Yeah, I mean, it, that's, it, I guess this is the difference between uh, the problem that I want to solve and the problem that you need me to solve exactly and businesses focus individuals we all focus on what we want to be doing really and uh you know we see that with when we're working with clients we explain very clearly what they need to do and they don't want to do it because they want to do what they want to do sometimes you know this yes. is the individuals within the business well i'd, I'd rather not do that i'd rather just focus on this okay but that's not going to solve the problem that you that you have um so I, I must say when 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 rob said go on introduce yourself leah and you started to talk uh, you had me at poetry major yeah <laughs> so 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 t t tell us a little bit about that before we get back into business type stuff oh yeah um i'm actually a creative writing major with poetry as my focus uh 
I've always loved words, loved language, um, and I decided to pursue creative writing after environmental studies because it was too difficult. I had to go to three different schools to get my degree. So 40 credits in, I'm like, what will get me out of school the fastest and what do I like? So that's how we ended up, I ended up there. And I actually absolutely loved it because I got put into this class as a transfer student. It was um, in Italian, which I don't speak. Um, and it was reading Purgatario in Italian with an English companion. And it was sort of a translation focus. And we had to write like a hundred page thesis at the end of this. So I'm like, oh dear God, what am I gonna write about? Um, so I focused on one verb, schianti, which means schism. And I based my whole thesis on that and I'm like, I hope he buys this load of crap because I don't know. <laughs> I'm like pulling it out of every direction, but it was based on like Dante's exile and you know how frequent that word showed up because when he wrote it, he was in like a very negative headspace, a lot of digs for his political rival. So it ended up being a really good piece and almost got me a trip to Italy, but I couldn't go because I had to work. But um, that's kind of how I got really into an analysis was not through data, but through words, through um, syllables, through commas. And I think poetry does real, real wonders for the brain because it's micro analysis. It's like, uh, is there, um, you know, what's the theme? How's the structure? Why are the words chosen in this order? What is the context of the writer? I, I really do think people in technology should study the arts. It enriches your ability to connect the dots. I know I'm doing like my little PSA here, but I don't know if you found that experience as well, like having an arts or a philosophy or a music background, has, how has that helped you in your careers? I, I don't have an arts background. <laughs> I have a, okay. a, a, an appreciation for it. Um, but you do have an, an art. art history class. You do have an art that counts because mathematics is a pure math is an art, isn't it? That Can that's be. a language unto itself, most yeah. definitely. <laughs> but uh, I don't know if it's necessarily art. I suppose it can be if it's applied in certain ways. But really, that's what I, I wanted to ask you when when we started talking about the poetry. How does a background in the arts influence? business strategy beyond oh i hope he buys this bs i can see the business application of that but <laughs> um beyond that yeah it, and it wasn't just poetry like i was one of those uh kids that had no clue what they wanted to do i've taken etruscan history i've taken you know national park management you name it i think diversity of thought and really uh connecting the dots seeing things through your own filter, but then being able to step out and see it through another analytical lens, um, you know, from like colonial lit, putting yourself in like John Winthrop's shoes, like what was going on when he wrote that. So it it's, teaches you empathy because you need to understand the source text in order to have a perspective. And I think it's the same with business, whether you're reading customer reviews, watching videos, understanding who that person is, what they do, what matters to them, what is their aspiration, and how can you be the Virgil to their Dante in the story? Like, that is a really valuable skill I picked up um, studying uh, poetry. I, I, I think that the, the answer is one of passion. So yeah. even though you love your job and it's really interesting, when you started speaking about poetry, you became a different person. <laughs> and and I, I think that that's true for all of us. You know, we, we all, if, if you know, you get to our sort of age and, and you have to be doing something that you love doing and we all love doing what it is that we're doing. Um, but we have other stuff that really fires our, our imagination. And, you know, that we find is the, is, is the key to unlocking people's excitement in what it is that you do you know you've got a new product if you're not passionate about it no one else is going to be passionate about it so so your your copywriting must help you uh must help you to help clients to unlock that passion that they have for what it is that they do 
Yes, absolutely. And um, I also did a lot of interviews. I used to write for um, magazines like digital publications. So um, the hardest thing is uh, people think they have nothing unique to say or they have no unique perspective. And I think that's so like sad that that's a, um, you know, a belief. So I'll, I'll sit down and I won't even ask them about the product. I, I'll say like, you know, um, what made you get into this business? Did you study something else? What were you passionate, you know, passionate about? What are your interests? So getting to know them on a human level and then seeing, you know, what motivated somebody to pursue this business, this idea and taking those currents and infusing it so that passion shines through in the writing. It's like, for example, our, our person was a uh, surfer who saw issues with the Santa Monica Bay and how polluted it was. And that's sort of that undercurrent that motivated him, this passion for the earth, this passion for leaving it better than he found it. And whether that's in technology, nonprofit or whatever manifestation, that's that driving engine. And that was a really good observation that you had is passion, right? It's like digging and finding that sometimes it's buried really deep or you're not aware of it. Mm, very much so. So um, there is a um, if if anyone's if anyone's got a, is doing a startup, there's an amazing book Ooh. called The Mum Test, and um, uh, Rob Fitzpatrick has written a number of these books, and he writes them deliberately short. Um, and it's The Mum Test because he said if you ever do a startup, the first person you ask is your mum. So, for example, say you're going to create plastic buckets using um, uh, Adam's example. You'll go to your mom and you'll say, I'm going to create some plastic buckets. And she says, yeah, that's not a good idea. Wow, that would be fantastic. You'll be the king or queen or, or uh, of, of plastic buckets. You won't get the right answer that you want. Well, what you you get, you'll get the answer you want, not the answer you need. <laughs> yeah. So, so, um, so what happens is that it takes you. He takes you through a, a journey of how you go about asking questions to people um, about you, what it is that you want to do and and why you want to do it. And part of that is to come up and understand the category that you that you want to work in. I mean, there was an announcement this week that there are now fourteen thousand Martech products. Wow. I mean, th there must be some duplication in there. No, but mine is mine is really good. Mine is different. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think how many of those fourteen thousand do you remember? Right, those would be probably the the category, uh, you know, resting on their laurels type people. But um, I thought when you said the mom test, I thought of the grandmother test as, with like user experience and e interfaces, but equally well, valid. E yeah, equally valid. Yes. Yeah, that's awesome. What's the grandmother test? Uh, can your grandparent use the phone or the product? Industrial designers use it a lot. Uh, product designers like physical, uh, if they can't figure it out, it should be relatively easy. You know, are we being mindful of the size of text on the screen, button placement, things of that nature? So my my uh, father-in-law is an industrial designer and he, he always uh, is assessing forks and tines and things like that everywhere we go. And it's, it's it's funny to see that it still like carries through pretty much every interaction he has with the physical object. So if a business um, doesn't have, isn't getting the traction that it needs and it's been down all of these different marketing solutions. So, you know, they've redesigned their logo, they've rewritten their brochure, they've redesigned their website with uh, fantastic search engine optimization, elegant new navigation, or whatever it is that they've claimed they've done. Um, and they realize that the problem is more fundamental than that. You know, they're, they're selling a product that people either can't understand or don't know they need or whatever it may be. Uh, what's their next step? Because, you know, one of the things that, that we say when we're talking to, to a client is, uh, you know, if, if we're trying to to show them how to generate more pipeline, they're not going to listen to anything we say if they have lots of pipeline. You know, there has to be a pain there for them to want to move. So so uh, a company is, is looking at their strategy and they're thinking, we're trying all of this stuff and it is, simply isn't working. We're not able to, to crack this particular problem. 
what do they need to start doing? So in this scenario, they have pipeline or they don't? Uh, let, let's assume they haven't. Let's assume that they're, they're consistent with all of their messaging. Um, they've, they've tried logo redesigns. They've tried rebranding. They've gone to a new PR agency. They've tried pay-per-click. They've done everything that, that, that their chartered marketer has told them that they should do. And I'm not, not damning chartered marketers here. Um, and the sales team are, are, are facing the same challenges that every other sales team is. And no one wants to talk to them. So, so they're relying on putting a product in the marketplace and having people go, oh, that's interesting. I'd like to know more about that, as most businesses have to at some level. But that simply isn't happening. You know, they're going to events and people are walking past their, their stand. They're placing adverts and people are flipping past the adverts. They're, they're, they're active on LinkedIn, but people are not engaging with their content because you know, no matter how good the content is, where do they go to try try to tackle this problem because that's something that we see a lot of in the marketplace isn't it yeah i i think that my first step would be to understand if they have users how are users using it are they sticky what is adoption like are they you know what does their retention cycle look like i would look internal first and see um what is that journey looking like are people using the tool how are they using the tool and then getting a baseline of that maybe that would reveal where the shortcoming is in the messaging. Like maybe people aren't just using the tool um, or it's not serving their needs. I would start with product and retention and uh, adoption stats and see like what's happening. The same thing with a service. Are they renewing? Are they leaving decent C stats, uh, scores, customer satisfaction scores? What do their reviews look like to get a sense of like what could potentially be wrong diagnoses. The other thing too is like, are they being too salesy in their messaging? Um, do they have industry experts that are um, putting their thought leadership out in the market? And I hate that word, but like their perspective in the market. Uh, that's what I would look at is first product diagnose the problems with that and then potentially look at, you know, are they being too salesy instead of inspirational? I think it's quite interesting, the, uh, the, the, because you, you made that point a number of times uh, uh, during our discussion, and I just find quite interesting the fact that actually the ones who know best what you're doing as a business are your customers. Uh, and therefore, uh, um, <clears throat> it should be your primary source of um, yeah, information about what you do. Uh, it's it's I just find it interesting because it's just it's just almost working the other way around right yes it's uh, not intuitive <laughs> how many how many marketers talk to their customers not many and even higher up I'd even say some product people don't which is blows my mind I mean how do you how do you not but um and then it's how do you talk to them right do you lead yeah. them with questions I mean I sit on a lot of these lots of leading questions, why questions, which are always not good because it puts people's defenses up. What questions, how questions, observing somebody doing something versus somebody telling you something. So yeah. there's there's a real art to customer research, user research. And uh, I think the companies that have these second reincarnations and are successful realize that that's a critical ingredient to G go to market mes messaging, category creation, all of that product development. And it used to be a bigger thing, like in my career in the 2010s, 2015s, like user research was a pretty big part, especially in the larger enterprises. I've seen it shrink because everybody's working on these accelerated timelines, right? But they're putting things into market that aren't necessarily aligned with what the customers are just for the haste of getting there first. And it's like, well, you got there. Nobody wants what you're offering. So maybe you rushed it a bit too much. So I, I, I it's, it's just like in life, like you need to slow down in order to perceive the value and get rid of that narrow ton of tunnel vision you have and get a broader view of what's happening. Mm. You yeah, mentioned. I mean, I, I think to a certain extent, customers, you know, everybody, they think that they're right, don't they? 
Yeah. So I, I don't need to check with my customers because what do they know? You know, I know <laughs> I know the answers here. And actually, and actually, yeah. I think every, everybody is guilty of that to a certain extent, aren't they? Both personally and in business. And I yeah. think that one of one of the things that that we see and and you know we often drum it in when we're coaching people is that you know whether you like it is irrelevant it's whether or not your audience likes it that's relevant and be really pragmatic about this you know I've, I've written the best post ever and everybody has ignored it and then I've written a quick thing that I've knocked out and published and loads of people have liked it well that tells me what my audience are going to consume and and that kind of pragmatism is is so vital isn't it so so how do, so how do organizations and the people within them be more pragmatic about understanding what's working and what isn't rather than just assume you know i know best we're going to do it my way yeah data especially with certain personalities really opens those conversations so if you're going you know it's not it shouldn't just be opinion whether it's qualitative or quantitative, you collect both sides of house and you present it like this is our engagement metrics. This is, you know, our pipeline growth, et cetera, retention rates. And then you can say like, this is how I'm diagnosing the problem. Like in a human body, it might be hypertension, right? To sort of build that narrative of like, there is a problem, right? And then um, I would also ask them to say, well, what are your goals in you know the next six months, a year? How is what we've done so far supported those goals? And get their take on it. Um, and I think when you ask that question, many of them will be like, well, we haven't supported our goals because of X, Y, and Z. It's like they know the answer to the test. They just need to be asked the test question a little differently. Um, so that would be being too salesy yeah but i have a quota i have to sell what should yeah. i be doing <laughs> instead um you know so sales the best sales people are like uh pain point solvers right they understand the person what what is really that person's problem their aspiration and they lead with that they're not just like hey product in your face you know they're just like um you know are you struggling to stand out in a tough market are you um finding it harder and harder to get yeah, a growing set of tasks done are you finding it difficult to communicate with your team so sort of touching on that empathy before ever mentioning a solution or a product um so it's really training salespeople to lead with heart um and then you can sort of show them your solution but i think you have to make it drive that you understand their problem first and that's how you avoid in my mind being very salesy but do you understand my problem i have to make quota <laughs> yeah well what are some of the challenges in hitting that quota what has been some of your experiences and getting asked you know if that's the question they lead with try to get to the bottom of it why you know are you meeting quota have you met quota in the past what has changed um and i think people will open up when you're curious about their experience instead of just trying to push your push your story yeah. uh, i've i've had i've seen comments on uh, linkedin where uh, people have said uh yeah but sales have got a sale and marketing has got a market <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you're you're still doing that function. It's just doing it in a different way, right? In a, you know, there are many ways, right? There are different sales methodologies. This is just another one of those, right? And with any salesperson or marketer too, you have to keep testing, A-B testing, um, you know, seeing, really taking time to analyze what's working and what isn't. I think a lot of people skip that over don't run tests long enough or don't run any tests, right? For example, we did an A-B campaign. We tested a two hour, one hour, three hour. Then we try, you know, did a headline having one variable or two variables at most tested. So there's also the analytical side of the house where um, just as you have that empathy driven approach, you need to have the data rigorous analytics approach. And then when you marry the two, that's when you're very successful.
So if you think about the the way that an organization um, starts up, um, there's going to be certain points. So it starts off with a founder. And what that founder does is that they go out and sell to their network. Um, and what they do is because they want to, um, um, they're going to win business, they're going to basically take anybody that pretty much buys. So, so at that point, um, they may not be solving the problem they think they're solving because really it's their mates buying their product. Um, and then they go through a process where they get probably their first salesperson or they start moving out of that circle. They've got to kind of move out, punch out of their network and sell elsewhere. What what should founders be doing as they go through that process in terms of understanding the category and um, and, and working on that? Yeah, so making sure that their narrative, whether it's to networks, friends, et cetera, is aligned with the go-to-market narrative. I think that's something that happens. There's a schism between what the founder is saying, what sometimes the CEO, the CMO. You want to make sure everybody is on brand, on message. And what we do at my organization is we actually have everybody in the organization do a pitch and we watch it okay. and we give them feedback. And that's a really good way. And Maybe in those sessions, somebody is doing something that's just blowing your mind and everybody's sort of glued to the screen. So then maybe we adjust that master pitch to reflect the one that's winning. So it's an iterative process and it's something that you shouldn't just do once. Like you do this pitch exercise, do it in three months, do it in six months. And it's fun. You can make it like a lunch and learn. Everybody just, you know, give everybody free lunch and watch do pitches. However, your organization's culture is, you can make it into something that people don't dread, but, um, you know, appreciate as a learning uh, opportunity. Yeah. Cause in the uh, book, um, in the book Creativity Inc. by Ed Catmull, um, which is a great book about because um, he started Pixar. Um, but it's also a great book as well because of the fact that um, Steve Jobs was on the, the, the board. So you get you, you get two books in one. One is a book about Pixar and one is a book, a book about Steve Jobs. And, and, and what they do is what he does is he talks about the creativity process of creating the Pixar movies and how they would have this meeting where everybody would go along and your job that the job was of the the creative team to pitch the story um and for everybody else to go i didn't get that bit so um the the, the it, one of the one of the, the the films he talks about is what finding nemo and the, and 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 the process they went from in terms of this is what the original story was and people didn't get it and how they basically went through that 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 meeting process i can't remember what they call the meeting um, to 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 it to it being what it is and what we know it is to for today. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's the best way to test your message, right? Is like put it in front of an audience. Um, and yeah, Finding Nemo. Interesting fact is that the father fish would have turned into a mother fish because clownfish are uh, hermaphroditic. So he, <laughs> so that was just like some random thing I learned. I did not know that. Um, my son taught me that. Yeah, but I, I think that's a really important. Uh, it's a really important thing to to ask the audience and and kind of have that opportunity to explore stuff. So so Tim and I have worked together for eight years now, and kind of when one of us does something, you know, like we deliver a presentation or we do a pitch or we we speak at an event or whatever, we get the that was really good, well done bit over and done with, and then we focus on but and then these are the bits that the audience didn't like that they didn't understand that uh, you didn't deliver as well as you could have done and focus on those bits because absolutely you know it's not about pointing and criticizing but it absolutely is about saying these are the areas where there is room for improvement so go and improve them kind of thing and i think that often um organizations there is a culture where you're vilified for making mistakes isn't there if something isn't as yeah. good as it could be or as good as you can make it it's like well that that's a, a crime almost and i think that yeah. that in order to to kind of carve the niche you presumably you need to have that kind of there's no such thing as a wrong answer attitude don't you absolutely and i think so much of this boils down to 
leadership too um, and doing the hard work there. Um, I, I did a wonderful leadership program through Next Gen Center. It, from everything from conflict resolution to how not to give compliment sandwiches, the art of giving and receiving feedback. I, I, everyone I believe should be well-versed in, in those what softer skills because it's necessary to do the more technical, the more creative skills. Um, but yeah, I, I think there is this culture of you're wrong, I'm gonna get fired, this fear, right? I think it's also in this uh, cycle where there's a lot of layoffs, people are very afraid of being wrong and they're playing safe. And that doesn't ultimately serve the organization in the long run as people chip at their market share. So like you said, it's a opportunity to learn to do better. And I'd even add is, so you have people of different seniority experience, how can we make this better together? Ask people in a room for their feedback of like, okay, this part of the presentation didn't land as well. What can we do to fix it? So that everybody hears the solution set and then can apply it themselves. It's sort of like um, teaching rather than directing. Hmm. You can't really create a category and play it safe simultaneously, can you? Correct. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> it's tough. You can't straddle the line. It's either rip the band. You just have to rip the band aid. It's tough, but I look at it this way. Okay. You hold on to whatever you're doing for like another year, another two years, then what you're in exactly the same position and you're behind. So, uh, sometimes facing the hard truths and postponing them is just as problematic as ignoring them. Mm. It was interesting. You were talking about the uh, pitch contest earlier. Yeah. Uh, not the pitch contest, but the pitch training. <coughs> yeah. And, uh, because you know, in a very similar way to what you were explaining, uh, uh, you know, listening to customers, talking to customers, ask, asking the right questions, I've experienced that actually asking your employees to pitch, I mean, build their own pitch, can yeah. be quite, quite, uh, quite interesting as well, <laughs> uh, and sometimes much better than uh, than uh, well, maybe much better. Uh, I don't know, but at least uh, uh, great ideas can arise from 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 that type of exercise. Absolutely. Well, it's crowdsourcing, isn't it? Basically. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I use AI too now. So I actually create wow. what I call AI personas and I have them test my pitch. So I say, this is person is in my ICP is a skeptic is really angry, blah, 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 whatever the type of personas I come against. And I'm like, what would be the questions they ask? What would be their criticisms? And then I do it for the champion. What would the champion say? And then I'd also, so I basically have the AI layer, the customer layer, the internal layer, and then the truth lies in sifting all of that data and making it actionable. But AI has some tremendous applications for objection handling, teaching sales, um, how to do that better if they're in a time crunch and they need to prepare. So I work on a lot of prompts like that for sales enablement. So typically what does one of those prompts look like? So you know we, we've all we've all yeah. dabbled with Chat GPT and whatever other tools, um, and I'm speaking for myself here. I can see that it has fantastic possibilities and applications, but none of them for me as things currently stand. So change change my mind. You know I, I'm I'm about to pitch something to a customer, and I think the customer is not in a place or there's somebody in there that's likely to be a, a, a detractor from this. How do I get some, some prep work for that in? Sure. So I would type out like I'm a long, I don't write like prompts. I write how I speak or how I would write to a friend. So I say, OK, this is the situation. I am doing this at this kind of company. This is my objective. This is what I'm selling. Give a description. And then I'd say, this is the person that I'm selling to, their characteristics, like kind of a character portrait or an analysis. And this is where that writing background comes in. And then I'd say, give me a list of conventional, unconventional objections they would have. Give me um, a list of questions uh, that they would have around a specific feature. And then I see what AI spits out. And then based on that prompt, I'll stay in the multi, like a multi-thread prompt, I'll ask it follow-up questions. Okay, great. 
And now I'm also selling to an IT person along with this sort of bombastic character. This character is like this. What questions would they have? So I prep myself by trying to come up with questions that maybe my alone I wouldn't think of. And that's what I use the AI for primarily. Brilliant. Um, Leah, it works this has with been anything. Great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How can people uh, get to know more? How can they connect with you? Um, oh, you can send me a DM on LinkedIn, add me as a connection. I'm super friendly. Um, I'm also broke girl branding on Instagram. I uh, have little AI tips and uh, show my life in up upstate Saratoga, New York. And yeah, so those would be the two primary methods, LinkedIn and Instagram. Fantastic. And if you have something to say, we want to hear from you. Scan the QR code on screen or visit us at digitaldownload.live and fill out the Be Our Guest application form. On behalf of the panelists, to our guest, to our audience, thank you all and see you next time on the Digital.